In this video, we're going to be building on more fundamentals that we need to talk about for us to fully understand proteins and enzymes. So one of the fundamentals that we need to talk about is amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks for our proteins and help us understand the active site and what's going on with these reactions. But in order to fully grasp how amino acids work to help function for enzymes and proteins, we have to understand polarity and intermolecular forces. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Well, for the most part, we're familiar with the two types of bonding. Ionic bonding, which is an electrostatic attraction between a cation and an aion, and covalent bonding, which focuses on a sharing of electrons between two elements, usually between two nonmetals. When we're talking about intermolecular forces, this is when we're focusing about the attraction or the repulsion forces between two molecules, not so much the interactions that go on within them. Intramolecular forces being the forces within the single molecule, such as ionic, covalent, or metallic bonding, where intermolecular forces are the forces in between molecules, kind of what we're going to talk about today. First example of intermolecular forces is the strongest one, which is ion-ion interactions. The interesting thing about ion-ion interactions is that the intramolecular force and the intermolecular forces are the same. One thing that really helps me with understanding intermolecular forces is focusing on the charges. For example, we mentioned how ion-ion is the strongest, and it's coming from two permanent charges. Later on, we're going to find the interactions between partial charges and molecules with no charges. Before we start diving into our next example, let's talk a little bit about polarity and dipoles. So remember that we have extremely electric negative elements the closer we get to fluorine on the periodic table. This means that these elements have a stronger pull on electrons. For example, in methanol here, we have the extremely electric negative element oxygen attached to the very non electric negative element hydrogen. So that's a very polar bond. So the electron density of those that shared covalent bond is going to be pointing more towards oxygen. This is going to give us a dipole, or how the charge is distributed in the molecule. The end where oxygen is, is going to be partially negative because of the increase in electron density that we can see with the color red. But on the hydrogen side, we're going to see a decrease of that electron density, forming a partial positive charge. This is what we call partial charges. We can talk about our second example of intermolecular forces between a permanent charge from an ion and a partial charge from a dipole or a polar covalent molecule. So we can see here in this example that we have, for example, we can have a cation like sodium and how it's interacting with water, which has those partial charges and how it's interacting more with the oxygen, the side with the partial negative charges. But let's say our example was flipped and we had a chlorine instead of sodium. Well, the orientation of the water molecules will be flipped, so the partial positive sides, near the hydrogens, will face the ion. Now we're ready to talk about our third example of intermolecular forces, and the third strongest type of intermolecular forces. This is dipole-dipole interactions. But within dipole-dipole interactions, we have two tiers. We have hydrogen bonding interactions, and non-hydrogen bonding interactions. Let's break down essentially what a hydrogen bonding dipole-dipole interaction means. So we have the extremely electric negative elements nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These three elements will be able to pull off hydrogen's electron density more than any other element. So what happens is if we have a nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine connected to a hydrogen in one molecule, and that hydrogen is attracted to another nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in another molecule, well, we're going to have a really strong dipole-dipole interaction, and this is what's considered hydrogen bonding. But right here we have two examples of dipole-dipole hydrogen bonding interactions. We have one between two water molecules, then we have one between methanol and water. Do you see how it has to deal with these strong electronegative elements, in this case oxygen, being attracted to a hydrogen that has its electron density pulled off of it from another strong electric negative element like oxygen? When thinking about non-hydrogen bonding dipole-dipole interactions, this is just polar covalent molecules having intermolecular forces with one another, but it just doesn't fit the parameters of hydrogen bonding. So we can see here up here in the corner that we have an intermolecular force between chloroform 
and water. Now, even though we have polar covalent molecules, we don't fit the limitations. You see, chlorine is not part of the list for hydrogen bonding. Before we dive into the other intermolecular forces, I just want to talk about nonpolar molecules a little bit. They have an even distribution of their electron density. So here we see nitrogen gas and a hydrocarbon. Both of these examples have their electron densities evenly distributed throughout the molecule. So when we talk about the next forms of intermolecular forces, it's going to be talking about changing that even distribution of electron density. Next two examples are pretty similar, so I'm just going to group them together. So we have ion-induced dipole and dipole-induced dipole. So what this means is that we have a nonpolar molecule where the electron density is evenly distributed. But if we pass by a charge by it, it's going to force the electrons in one direction, like magnets. So if we pass by a ion, a negative charge, it's going to push the electron density to the other end. This is going to force a dipole in that molecule, as long as that ion is there present. And so, an ion-induced dipole is going to be a little stronger than a dipole-induced dipole, since an ion has a permanent, more stronger charge than a partial charge from a dipole. Before we talk about our last example of intermolecular forces between molecules, I just want to conceptualize something first for a minute. So, we know that we have nonpolar molecules that have an even distribution of their electrons. But this doesn't mean that for any given second, we could have more electrons in one area than the other, just momentarily. This is kind of what London dispersion forces is all about. Now, all molecules have London dispersion forces, but their effects are so small that we only truly see them when we're talking about the intermolecular forces between two nonpolar molecules. Now, there's an added interest. The longer and less branch the nonpolar molecules are, the stronger the London dispersion forces are going to be between them. This is because we have a greater surface area in which we can have those London dispersion forces. Because a London dispersion force is just a momentary attraction from dis disturbing the electron density in the molecule. But it momentarily snaps back to being evenly distributed. That's our last intermolecular force from ranking them from strongest to weakest. Now intermolecular forces help us explain boiling points, melting points, cohesive and adhesive forces, and even viscosity. A lot of things go into when considering intermolecular forces, but we've talked about enough details that we needed to talk about to help us explain properties of amino acids when we talk about polypeptide chains and the building blocks for proteins. Just wanted to take this time to say thank you so much to Christine over on Instagram. Her handle is Sketcheroos. I'll definitely link them in the description, but these stickers, Be Kind and Your Ray of Sunshine are honestly awesome. So you guys should go check them out. Um, but besides that, I hope you guys have an amazing day.